The views and opinions expressed in Cold and Missing are exclusively those of the hosts. All parties mentioned are considered innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Cold and Missing also contains adult themes and languages. Listener discretion is advised. I'm your host, Ali McLaughlin Solkowski. And I'm your co-host, Eli Solkowski. And this is Cold and Missing, where we cover cold cases and missing person cases. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Eli. And I'm Allie. And this is Cold and Missing. And this is episode 41. The 41st episode. Way to go, baby. We are here, zeroing in on a year of Cold and Missing. Yeah. Amazing. Slowly but surely, it'll be here before we even know it. Yeah. But without Um, further ado. Yeah. Would you like to start us off? Yeah, let's just get into it. I have a lot this week, so. Oh, okay. Great. Let's, uh, let's get started. Groovy. So today I have for you a missing person case, and it is the missing person case of Brandon Swanson. And this takes place in May of 2008 in southwest Minnesota. We're going to be mentioning a few towns, but it's centered around Marshall, Minnesota. But first, a little bit about Brandon. Brandon is 19 years old in 2008. He was born January 30th, 1989, and he would be 34 years old today. He was born and raised in Marshall, Minnesota. He had just finished his freshman year at Minnesota West Community College and Technical College at the Canby campus. He studied wind turbines and had planned to transfer to Iowa Western Community College and major in science. His family and friends say that he had a big heart, his smile lit up his whole face, and he believed in doing the right thing. And at this time in 2008, he drove a green Chevy Lumina. And now into the timeline of events. On Tuesday, May 13th, 2008, Brandon spends the day celebrating the end of the school year. He spent the day in Lind, Minnesota with friends. He was wearing baggy jeans, a blue striped polo shirt, a black hoodie, a white twins baseball cap, wired rimmed glasses, and a silver necklace. Brandon pops into his house to say goodbye for the night. Only his mom, Annette, was home. She said, quote, I said the things I normally say to him. See you later. Be safe. End quote. Brandon then spends the night celebrating the end of the year in Canby near his campus. Brandon was observed drinking alcohol at two of the parties that he attended that evening, but none of the attendants say that he was drunk. Just before midnight, Brandon leaves Canby to drive home to Marshall, Minnesota, a trip that he did a lot because he was commuting back and forth to school. It's roughly a 30-mile drive, but instead of taking Highway 68, which would have been a straight shot home, Brandon decided to take the back roads that evening. So Brandon leaves the party, and it's just after 1 a.m., so this is now May 14th, 2008. Brandon is driving west down a maintenance road between two large crop fields. He was attempting to turn south on a gravel road when he missed the field approach and went into the ditch at a low speed. The ditch was shallow but steep and the car frame was hung up so Brandon could not move the car. At 1.15 a.m., he starts to call a few friends for help, but he's unable to reach anyone. Finally, at 1.54 a.m., he calls his parents. He asks his parents to come and get him, and he tells them that he's in a ditch between Marshall and Lind, Minnesota. Brandon tells his folks that he can see lights from the nearby town of Lind. Brandon's parents, Brian and Annette, hop in their pickup truck and head towards what they believe is Brandon's location. He stays with his car and on the phone with his parents. The call drops occasionally, but they're able to call him right back. When his parents get to where they believe Brandon is, they try to signal each other. Brandon tries flashing his lights, the parents try flashing their lights up and down the road, but could not see each other. Brandon, according to his parents, was certain of his location and did not seem intoxicated. Eventually, Brandon, still talking to his mother, gets frustrated and hangs up on her. When she calls him back to apologize, he says he's walking towards Lind and to meet him there. He'll meet them at the Lindwood Tavern, which was a popular bar in the area. Brian calls Brandon back at 2.17 a.m. During the call, Brandon says that he is walking next to a gravel road, but decides to cut across a field, thinking it will be quicker. Brandon also told his father that he had to hop fences and could hear water running nearby. Eventually, at 3.10 a.m., Brandon says, oh shit followed by silence. His parents keep the line active, but they can't hear anything. 
They call his name, thinking maybe he dropped the phone and would be able to hear them to find it because it's the middle of the night and Brandon is walking by moonlight at this time. After a few minutes, they hang up and call back, thinking that the phone will ring and light up so he'll be able to find it. The phone rings a couple of times and then goes to voicemail. Brandon's parents continue to look for him and try to call him, but they are unsuccessful. At 6.30 a.m., Brandon's parents call police to report him missing. The Lind police initially are unconcerned and tell them it's normal for a young man to stay out all night after a semester ends. One officer even tells Annette that Brandon had, quote, a right to be missing, end quote. Eventually, Lind police officers do begin to look for him, but can find no trace of him in or around Lind. So they call the Lyon County Sheriff to help expand the search. The Lyon County Sheriff obtains Brandon's cell phone records, which actually put him near Taunton, Minnesota, about 25 miles away from Lind. Police find Brandon's car at 12.30 in the afternoon. Sheriff Eric Wallen says, quote, The vehicle simply looked like it was stuck in the ditch, or partially in the ditch. There was nothing odd about it. If a person passed by, they would think it was just parked there or broken down and stuck. End quote. There was no serious damage to the car, but the car frame was hung up enough to keep two of the wheels on one side from touching. The car did not have the keys in it. It is presumed that Brandon has them, but the car was unlocked, and according to the FBI, the doors were open. Inside the car, it's reported that there was a cannabis pipe, and curiously, Brandon's glasses. Brandon was legally blind in his left eye and had trouble with depth perception, especially at night. So it's curious that he would leave his glasses behind when he was walking in the dark. Searchers focus on the area around Brandon's car, but nothing is found. On Thursday, May 15th, so this is the next day, the Lyon County Sheriff requested the help of the Codington County Search, Dive, and Rescue Team from South Dakota, and by 11 a.m. they arrive. The bloodhounds pick up Brandon's scent. From Brandon's vehicle, the scent went half a mile south and turned west onto 390th Street, where it continued for a mile. The trail then turned north for half a mile and then turned west onto a driveway of an abandoned farm. The trail followed the driveway a quarter of a mile and then left the driveway and roughly followed the course of the Yellow Medicine River heading northwest. At one point, the bloodhound jumped into the river and exited. The dog handler interpreted this as Brandon possibly falling into the water at some point, but getting back out. The bloodhound picked up on the trail again, headed toward a drainage ditch, where it continued north towards 160th Avenue. Here, the dog lost the trail. The Department of Natural Resources deployed gates into the Yellow Medicine River, because at this time, it was 10 feet deep in some places. Searchers scour the area around the river with dogs, ATVs, horseback, and drones. The next day, Brandon's phone stops working. People had been trying to call it continuously over the past day, and it had continued to ring, but today it stops ringing. Police continue their efforts in searching for Brandon, focusing on a five-mile radius around the car, the thought being that in the 47-minute phone call with his dad, he would not be able to walk more than five miles an hour. An average adult can walk about three miles an hour. On May 20th, six days after Brandon disappeared, police call off their search. Brandon's parents immediately begin organizing searches that same weekend. And almost every weekend for the next several years, weather permitting, they would be out searching. Police at this time believe Brandon is in the Yellow Medicine River and that it could take weeks for the body to emerge. Lyon County Sheriff Joel Dahl says, quote, If I had to lay any money down, I'd say we're missing him somewhere in the water. He's in an eddy somewhere being held down by a log. He's got to be here. Everything is consistent that he was walking and something happened to him. End quote. So Brandon's family continued to search for him over the weekends, and by July of 2008, Brandon's family are helped by David and Linda Francis. They had a son, John, who went missing while climbing mountains in Idaho. It took over a year to recover his body, but in his memory, his parents have created the John Francis Foundation to help locate those missing in the wilderness. Brian Swanson says, quote, they've been very supportive. They talked with us. They listened to us. Emotionally, that has really helped coming from somebody who has gone through this terrible situation. 
I hope nobody else ever has to go through this. I wish it would never happen again to anybody. It's just so painful. We're going to keep looking. That's all we can do until we find him. There's no way I could stop until I know where he is. Either way it ends, it ends. It's closure. End quote. Brandon's parents have also left the porch light on for him, and this is something that they continue to do into 2023. Brandon's mother, Annette, says, quote, That morning when we left, we turned the porch light on for him. Well, we haven't turned it off since. We're leaving it on until he comes home. End quote. The search for Brandon continues almost every weekend through the summer and fall, but by November of 2008, the police rejoined the search. At this time, crops had been harvested, and the area that Brandon went missing is mostly farmland. The water levels of the Yellow Medicine River had also drastically lowered, so these were all favorable conditions to find any evidence of Brandon, but nothing is found. No cell phone, no keys, no clothing, no jewelry. And then searches halt in the winter times, especially in Minnesota, which gets a lot of snow, which would make ground searches extremely difficult. But in March of 2009, the searches continue. On Wednesday, May 6, 2009, Brandon's law was signed into effect by the governor. This waives the 24-hour waiting period for missing adults under suspicious circumstances. The searches continue, but one of the most notable things that I found in the searches come from the November 14th through the 15th search of 2009. So at this time, searchers believe that they are getting close to the remains, and they point to two moments of this search that make them think this. The first is the scent of human remains was transferred to a searcher's boot. All three of the dogs hit on it. Searchers believe that the scent was blown into the area. And the second event is two of the three dogs alerted to a field cultivator that was parked alongside a field. Searchers believe that there are a number of ways the scent had got there. But all this considered, they believe they are very close. But nothing was found of Brandon's during this time. Searchers also become interested in Mud Creek, which runs north of Yellow Medicine River, because dogs alerted there also, but again, nothing is found there. Now, the search for Brandon continues year over year over year. The last notable search took place in the fall of 2021. The Yellow Medicine River had dried up due to drought. Eric Wallen, the Lyon County Sheriff, says, quote, We've had excavators come and sift through the dirt looking for something, whether it's remains or property. End quote. However, an issue that has persisted since the start of the search is land access. Farmers don't want the dogs around their cattle or to damage crops. And there are still fields that searchers have not been able to access since 2008, so they've never been searched. Ken Anderson of Emergency Support Services, who help run the search for Brandon Now, says, quote, In at least a couple of circumstances, that problem is still in existence. They will not allow us on their property. We don't dispute the reason why. We try and work out a method that would make it acceptable, and we've not been able to come up with a working compromise, end quote. Police say they continue to get tips in the case, but they all fizzle out. Lyon County Sheriff Eric Wallen says, quote, It seems that every tip that we receive, we investigate, and we run into a dead end. It was either false or the information wasn't accurate. They all seem to run into a dead end, end quote. Annette Swanson, Brandon's mother, stopped physically searching for him in 2008. She said she couldn't be the one to come across him, but she spearheads the fundraising efforts to keep the search going. And she says, quote, I want people to remember Brandon. Talk about Brandon. Brandon is a real person. He touched a lot of lives, and don't forget him, end quote. So with that, if you know anything about the disappearance of Brandon Swanson or his whereabouts today, please call the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, and you can specifically ask for Agent Derek Woodford, and that number is 651-793-7000. And the sources for today's podcast come from the St. Cloud Times, the Argus Leader, CNN.com, the Marshall Independent, the search for brandonswanson.blogspot.com, and the Crime Wire. So that is the case of Brandon Swanson. You chose a missing person case that I actually know quite a bit about. Really? Yes. This is a 
more popular case. It, it's been done on a lot of um, podcasts. It, it's just one that as soon as I heard about it, it's just it's stuck in your head. And yeah. so I, I wanted to cover it. And I, I wanted to look into it because there's been a lot of rumors. There's been a lot of theories out there. So I just wanted to know what the facts were of this case. And these are the facts that I could come up with and verify. And I've been following this case for multiple years. Mm-hmm. I was a fresh, uh, I was just finishing my freshman year of college. Mm-hmm. I was the, we we're the same age. Mm-hmm. And particularly I took uh, an interest in it because we had a pond on my college that unfortunately someone had fallen into mm-hmm. and um, mm-hmm. resulted in them um, passing away, which mm-hmm. is sad. But anyway, just it was the time and um, yeah, I took an interest in it and have followed it ever since. So I have, not that anyone has asked for it, but I have my own theory that mostly I echo what law enforcement says in this case. Mm-hmm. And it's quite possible that because of probably wasn't that cold. Actually, I looked this up. Um, it it did get really cold that night. It was Yeah, yes. It was um, like upper 30s, lower 40s, to the point where if he did get wet, hypothermia would have set in. Yes. So what I think, I think that the oh shit, he dropped his phone. It was damaged, but we know the phone was still taking calls into the following day. Mm -hmm. For two days, yeah. Yeah. So the phone was still taking calls. I think like... Just a possibility of a few drunk things happen in the moment that made him kind of like ping pong around. Mm -hmm. And then eventually he fell into the river. But the thing about Yellow Medicine River is that it is a watershed. It's a drainage basin, which you already mentioned. Mm -hmm. And especially that time of year, if, if that happened, then like that's where he is. And... It's pretty clear to me his remains are in those spaces that we've never had access to. Mm -hmm. Like, that makes close to 100% sense to me. So that's my theory, is that he's there. Now, if you really want to go down the pathway that some people have that something sinister has happened on those properties and that's why we don't have access to them Mm -hmm. go for it the theories are out there but i don't think that that's the case Mm -hmm. i i don't think maybe anything nefarious happened to him but i i did have a different theory coming out of this as to what happened to him based off of the scent dog my theory is you know he kind of follows that trail the oh shit moment, whatever that is, if he slips, if he falls, if he goes into the water, if he drops his phone. I think at some point he does fall into the Yellow Medicine River, but because the dogs do pick up his scent on the other side of the river, I think that could suggest that he continued walking, but he's wet, it's cold, hypothermia would start setting in. So I think it's possible that maybe he sat down to try to warm himself up, to get his bearings, whatever, but he falls asleep in a field, on a field, near a field. And as those big machines come around and start tilling and moving the land and digging it all up, you wouldn't necessarily always see what's underneath you, and he kind of gets mixed up in these big machineries and in the field. Mm -hmm. And... If maybe after you were done using your machinery and you noticed some whatever on it, whether it be material, clothing, you know, just something odd stuck in your machine, near your machine, maybe you would put two and two together and decide, I'm never going to let them on my property. (laughs) I'm never going to let them on here because I don't need this and I didn't do anything wrong. So, because I... I just don't know why else you wouldn't let someone on your property. And especially after all this time, I would think that they would almost want to let them search it just to be done with it, just to so that they would stop asking. You know what I mean? Because 
that feels like part of it, but maybe it's not. Mm -hmm. But that's my theory. Oh, yeah, about hypothermia. Um, After a certain point, especially when you're drunk, you start, you believe that you are hot. So you take your clothes off. Yeah. And you would maybe step into the river Mm. to cool off. Mm -hmm. It is interesting to me, though, that just they've really searched this river. Like in all the missing person cases I've covered, even ones that have had very extensive searches, it is curious to me that, you know, no clothing, his hat, his shoes, the necklace he was wearing, nothing has ever been found. To the point that some searchers have said that, you know, he's not in Yellow Medicine River, he's in Mud Creek, and this is the creek I briefly mentioned. but It's north of it. Yeah, yeah, it runs north of Yellow Medicine River, and there have been canine hits Mm -hmm. there as well of um, human remains, but still no sign of him in Mud River either. And I I guess I want to make clear that I wasn't saying he was in the river. Like, that's where his remains are. Mm -hmm. I think he's, it's the field, it's Mud River. Mud Mud Creek. Mud Creek. Mm -hmm. This search, I think, will be kind of historic and will, like, go back and be analyzed about you know, scent trails and grid searches and things like that, just because it has been so extensive. It, it's been over 10 years of searches. Well, ultimately, we could talk about our own theories all day long. Yeah. But, and there's know, most importantly is figuring out what happened to him, you know, answers for his family. Yeah, they absolutely deserve answers and just, you know, bringing him home after all of this effort. And I think a lot of people are invested in the search for Brandon and just want to see him come home and, you know, be at peace and resting. Yeah. Again, for me, too, literally one man's opinion, because I'm sure (laughs) there are people that do not agree with me, which is totally fine. I encourage that. I definitely welcome it. Um, especially in true crime, I think it's important to stay mindful of all of the possibilities because that's where we find like where error happens is that enough people believe one thing and everyone gets stuck in that. Yeah. I mean, it's just whatever the evidence leads, you know, whatever the evidence suggests, like you can't, all facts are friendly. So you got to take them all into account until, until you got the whole picture. Um, but yeah, there's, and this is one of those cases that there's a hundred theories out there, but ultimately we just want Brandon to come home. So again, if you know anything about the disappearance of Brandon Swanson or his whereabouts today, please call the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and specifically Agent Derek Woodford at 651-793-7000. Thanks so much for being with us for uh, episode 41 and for continuing um, getting Brandon's name out there. This case has been there for a long time. Mm-hmm. And if you go to our website, coldandmissing.com, um, and click on Brandon's episode, I'm going to have just a, a Google Maps, or technically it's Apple Maps, picture of the scent trail that the dog picked up, just because I know I was saying like half a mile this way, and then you turned west. So just... If you are a visual person, which I am, you can go to Cold and Missing and find Brandon's episode, and that will be on the webpage. You can also follow us on Instagram. You can search us at Cold and Missing. That'll pop right up. And follow us there. You'll get updates. If we ever have to delay an episode or come out a day late, you'll be full in the know. So follow us there. And have a good week and stay safe, y'all. Stay safe, y'all.